Okay, this is a video lecture uh, for my EMBA class, and we're going to discuss conglomerates today. Conglomerates are uh, firms that have multiple businesses, and they happen to be unrelated. And so an interesting question is, how do those businesses create value, and how might they be governed? Conglomerates may be of interest in, to several of you because you work in such firms. Uh, so this may have particular relevance. Okay, there are two basic subjects we're going to cover. One is how do conglomerates create value? And the second is how do we govern these things and what factors influence their effective governance? We can see that conglomerates generally have lower returns and lower growth rates than more focused companies. And part of our uh, discussion today will try to reveal why this might be the case. We can see here uh, the trends with regards to diversification. Uh, the number of SIC codes corresponds to roughly the number of businesses uh, per firm. And we can see that uh, in the last 25 or 30 years that there are more focused firms, more firms with only one business. and. Uh, you see fewer firms with many different types of businesses. So this indicates that uh, the trend is moving away from conglomerate diversification and towards more focused diversification. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, governance. And of course, governance of firms is not just specific to conglomerates. It's also important for other firms. It's particularly relevant for, for conglomerates because um, uh, conglomerate diversification is, is questioned by many uh, as to whether it's valid or not. And uh, so governance plays a particularly important role of, of uh, uh, hindering uh, unrelated acquisitions. So let's talk about some of, the, some of the trends that are taking place in governance. Um, you know, uh, some changes like with Enron uh, events spurred some changes in governance policies and governance recommendations uh, and uh, such recommendations focus on things like um, how to treat shareholders, minority shareholders, not just majority shareholders, and making sure that those minority shareholders have equal rights. Um, they also focus on uh, stakeholders other than shareholders and emphasize that stakeholders are represented on the board of directors. Um, they also talk specifically about recommendations with regards to boards of directors. And this is important because the board of directors oversees the top management team. Um, you know, things like how many boards they should sit on, uh, what the nature of the board should be, should there be, uh, you know, what percentage of insider board members versus outsider board members? Whereas an insider represents uh, uh, somebody that works for the firm. Generally, good governance practices suggests a higher percentage of outside board members uh, because uh, the board is supposed to oversee see the managers. Um, it also outlines some suggestions with regards to integrity and ethical behavior. Um, and the amount of time expected to work uh, on a board, uh, etc. One example of a governance, specific governance practice is CEO duality, which is where the CEO is also the chairman of the board. Um, and uh, it's generally considered good practice to split the CEO um, and the chair role, but many U.S. companies do not do this, including many conglomerates. Uh, United Technologies is one. Um, uh, generally, it's good, uh, good practice because uh, the board is supposed to oversee management, and if the board and management are the same, uh, good, good governance does not occur and good monitoring does not occur. So you want to split those roles in general. This happens quite a bit in Europe. Uh, does not happen as much in the US, but it's recommended by uh, many of these actions, including the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Uh, my own research suggests that firms that have CEO duality 
are more likely to make acquisitions, number one. Number two, they're also um, uh, more likely to do so, be, not because they achieve higher abnormal returns, but because they're willing to accept lower returns which might be because managers want to grow the size of the pie or uh, perhaps because they have some sort of bias that's not properly governed by uh, the board. Some forms of governance uh, are market-oriented. Uh, for example, uh, activist shareholders and large block holders play an important role in trying to make sure that managers behave in a way that's consistent with shareholder value. And here's an example. We all know that uh, yogurt is a strategic French industry. I think that uh, a former president declared it so once upon a time when somebody uh, was stoking Danone. And now this American investor, Nelson Peltz, has bought a 1% stake in Danone and is looking to make various, is making various demands on management saying give us back more money and you know there's lots of room for for improvement here. Um, I mean, what, this is going to raise a lot of eyebrows in Paris, I suspect, this move. It will, it will. I, I doubt they'll like somebody, uh, particularly an American, coming and, and uh, plugging their nose into the yogurt industry. But Nelson Peltz has quite a history in the consumer goods sector. Mm. He's been involved in Cadbury and Kraft and White Dees in the past. So he's, he's got quite a track record in consumer goods. His, his demands for Danone, he, he wants to see more cash returned uh, mm. to shareholders. And he wants an improvement in profit margins from about 40%, 14% now to about 15%. So right. that's what he's hoping to achieve. I mean, I guess the, the, fact, the fact that he has taken this stake uh, suggests that he thinks the company is undervalued. But I wonder whether that's true or not. I mean, it's, you know, consumer goods is a tough industry. It's very competitive. There are some very big global players out there. And, uh, you know, companies are valued at what the market says they're valued at. They are, and then the market says that uh, Danone isn't worth as much as perhaps it used to be. The, the shares are more or less flat over the, over the past year or so, but it's had a very difficult year. It's mm -hmm. had a profit warning this year, largely because of uh, problems in, in Spain, where it's had to cut prices to compete with own label goods. So, And that's still a very big part of its business. Uh, Europe and dairy is still a mm -hmm. huge part of what Danone does, although it's also expanding mm -hmm. in other areas. But the shares, because of that profit warning, are at a discount to uh, Nestle which is the closest comparison company. So uh, perhaps Mr. Peltz thinks that by improving margins, returning cash, we can close that valuation gap. Yeah. Now, he has said that he uh, supports the chief executive of, um, of Danone, Frank Rubu. Uh, A previous reading has highlighted that firms with activists, investors, tend to outperform uh, the market in general. What we have here is uh, a list of companies um, the last three of which are conglomerates. The first is one that we studied earlier. Uh, and in the first column, you see the different ways that corporations can add value. Uh, and of course, Cadbury Schweppes emphasize synergy quite a bit, and maybe some market power because of their buying power. Uh, but uh, they, they achieve synergy in terms of cost and revenue um, across different businesses, the gum and the confectionery businesses that they had. So as we look at these other three conglomerates, uh, it'll be worth asking, well, how are they creating value? How are they creating value? And that's important uh, for you to consider when you take this class and beyond, hopefully. Okay, LVMH is a group of high-end luxury businesses and products. Uh, so here's a video.
Okay, so how does LVMH create value? I, you know, I'm just guessing here, but it, if I had the wager, I would say that um, a primary way they do so is through internal capital markets. They can probably, because they know the high prestige, the luxury brand market, they could probably spot opportunities better than others. Uh, another, um, I think, key way they might create value is by generating a internal labor market. Uh, they have experts in uh, luxury goods that they could transfer across these different products. And this not only helps them, but it, but it creates uh, an advantage for the employee who is interested in advancements uh, within the company. And so they're able to train and uh, reallocate these employees across these business units. So my guess is the internal resource markets, uh, not just capital, but also labor, are fundamental to the way that they create value. Just my guess. Okay, J and J is a healthcare company. They're in consumer healthcare, medical devices, and pharmaceuticals. So uh, it's widely considered to be a healthcare conglomerate. How do they create value? Try Basel. Investors in Johnson & Johnson have tried to gin up activist interest in breaking up the U.S. healthcare conglomerate. J&J &J could indeed use a shake, but for now, alas, it is unshakable. Over a decade, total returns at Johnson & Johnson have tracked healthcare stocks and lagged consumer stocks, despite having the best brand in the business. Its diversified model of drugs and devices and consumer products is something of a dud. Its $18 billion in net cash is a bad acquisition just waiting to happen. Alas, Johnson & Johnson's $290 billion market cap make it too big for most activists. The J&J &J culture is a barrier, too. The company's admirable credo puts customers first, employees second, and community third. Fair, note, not maximal shareholder returns come forth. The CEO talks about how the model allows a holistic approach and makes J&J &J a partner of choice. Maybe this will bear fruit someday. But why should the boss care? The last CEO oversaw a long period of underperformance, which ended in 2012. He left the company with a $140 million payout. J&J &J just isn't going to worry about activists, and the shares have not done badly enough for that to change now. Healthcare activists could, however, turn their guns on Switzerland. Conglomerate CEOs face tremendous pressure to create more value than their breakup value and to convey to shareholders how value is being created. It appears that J&J &J has done neither. You may wonder why J&J &J is considered a conglomerate. It has to do with the lack of relatedness of their three business units, medical devices, consumer products, and pharmaceuticals. While there is certainly resource sharing within those units, there is little opportunity to do so across the units. This begs the question, why are they inside the same firm? Might their experience in one enable inside information in another so they can allocate cash more efficiently in the market? Not likely. Neither does it seem likely they reallocate human capital across businesses more efficiently than the market because they're so diverse. What about Alphabet? How are they creating value with their diverse portfolio? Let's listen to a few perspectives on this. The first has to do with the recent restructuring at Google. As you know, the appropriate structure is one important way to help realize intended value. The FT. Google, the US technology giant, has announced a broad corporate restructuring that's aimed at accelerating its transformation from a web search and advertising company 
into a larger conglomerate with stakes in some of the most exciting and promising long-term technology developments. The move is going to see the company renamed as Alphabet and take on a holding company structure that puts its internet search business, the one that we're perhaps most familiar with, into a subsidiary company. I'm Matthew Vincent, a Deputy Companies Editor, and I'm joined now by our West Coast Editor, Richard Waters, who's been up for some hours looking at this launch of Alphabet. Richard, why has Google done this? And, and, and can you explain exactly what it has done? Well, this is the remaking, the reinvention of Google as an investment holding company. And essentially, what's been happening the last few years has been Google, the search engines, have been producing huge profits and they've been pumping a lot of that money into side bets. And we've all been, I think, uh, captivated by things like driverless cars and uh, a biotech company that's going to extend life expectancy indefinitely and so on. And now they've said, actually, don't think about us like that anymore. In fact, the side bets aren't side bets. They're the main thing. And so Google is now saying, you know, we are a holding company of which search is just one operating subsidiary. So when we spoke to Larry Page last year, you know, he said at the time, I want Google to become more like Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company. I want us to be seen as you know, an entity with all kinds of investments, a kind of conglomerate for the tech age. And that's effectively now what they're doing. But isn't there one key difference between Google and Berkshire Hathaway? And that's that Google, or Alphabet, to use the holding company term, is a group of businesses where some, or one in particular, the internet search for advertising business, is making an awful lot of money. And a whole load of other businesses are consuming a lot of money because they haven't yet brought their products to market and they aren't yet profitable. Absolutely. I think you know one way to understand Google is to think very long term and Larry Page and Sergey Brin have always said that. I think we can now see just how far ahead they're looking. You know, some of these bets are going to take years, decades to pay off if they ever do. But I think one of the motivating factors for Google has been we don't want to become Microsoft. We don't want our massive core business to simply start to atrophy when the world moves on. We want to use all that money to really bet on the future. So right now it looks very distorted. It's an animal with only one strong leg and it's going to take years for more legs to develop. But nonetheless, you know, that's the plan. Wall Street traditionally likes a bet but doesn't like them to be too long term. Jam today if it can be had. How have investors reacted to this restructuring by Google? Somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, they've given it the thumbs up. The stock price is up. Uh, in fact, immediately after the news, it added $29 billion to Google's stock market capitalization. And as the FT's Lex column said, you know, this is a $29 billion org chart because all they've done is reshuffle the pieces. Nothing has actually changed inside Google. However, you know, Wall Street looks at this and they think, we're going to find out more about what's happening inside Google. They want more transparency. And the new alphabet is going to disclose at least a little bit more about its different divisions. One thing that could do is make investors more comfortable with the core business, with the core Google, because they don't really know how well that's doing. And now they'll get to see. So that's one positive that comes out of this. And I think the other thing, and this is the real wild card, is that some investors are saying, you know, once you disclose these different things and you start to look at these businesses differently and you manage them differently, Long term, there's no reason for Google to stay together. These businesses may indeed start to spin off or split up. And Wall Street loves that kind of story. Yeah, so we could be seeing some little anagrams of uh, Alphabet before too long. Yes, indeed. I think, you know, we could be looking further down the road at uh, several baby Googles, but that is still some way off. Richard Waters, thank you very much indeed. How, how did you get to that? Why? Explain what your thinking was. Yeah, you, you guys got a kind of free thing because we announced that after we agreed to do this. Yes. No, that's, and you haven't talked about it much since you announced it. So yeah. you're here and everyone wants, uh, wants to know what the goal was. Well, we were really just trying to move up in the letters, you know, get closer <laughs> to A. And now we have, Triple A has that covered. Yeah. yeah they, <laughs> we have professional marketing people now, so we decided we might as well. Come on, no. did you do did you did you market test that? Uh, no. 
Okay. So we didn't want to tell Who, anyone. Whose so. idea was it? Well, actually, we had a bunch of suggestions we'd gone through, but actually, um, Sergey had credit for really picking it out of the list. And, and, and Which is only fair because I chose Google, so he chose Alphabet. Did you have alternatives? Yes, we did. I can't well, tell you what those are. So just one or two of them. We might use them for something else, so I could <laughs> Just give us one of them, just as a teaser? No, sorry. But uh, it is worth saying, you know, I was actually a little bit worried. Um, I wanted to have a name that people would be proud to work for the company called that. I actually didn't want it to be too catchy, because the idea really wasn't to have a consumer brand in the way that Google is, but really a brand for companies uh, to be part of. So really it's more for employees as we think about yeah. it. And for investors. Well, so look, here's one of the fundamental things that seems to me is different about the way you run Alphabet and the way many of the CEOs here run their company. I mean, many of them have been to business school. They studied strategy. They read Michael Porter's book, and it's and it's there's a there's a an emphasis on focus and making decisions about what you don't do as well as what you do decide to do. You're doing everything. I mean, you're going to remake. You want to remake the energy business. You want to remake the telecommunications oh, pieces business. Of it. You pieces, want to remake pieces. the transportation business. You want to. Uh, so, can you talk about how? I mean, you heard this from Steve Jobs. I understand. He said you're doing too many things. Yeah, I mean, he was right. I mean, he he did fine as well. Um, but you haven't slowed down. I mean, you're you. That's why we called you the most ambitious CEO in the universe. And the truth is, we didn't have data on the whole universe, but we, we, you know, it's a, it's a lot you're biting off. Yeah, no, I, I worry about that. In fact, and um, I think for me, you know, I mentioned how I wanted to make company kind of for engineers, like thinking about it that way. Um, I think also as an entrepreneur who started Google, trying to make a company for entrepreneurs also is something I think we're striving for, and. You know, I think in the same way, maybe when I was working for the consultant co company in D.C., it wasn't really my inner calling. You know, I think for most entrepreneurs, working for companies is also not so great. Why? Um, you know, I think it's a combination of companies generally trying to do the things they do well, plus the things that are adjacent, um, and not thinking creatively about you know, what they might have learned from doing one of the things they've already done. How that might not, translate into a new business. They're not ambitious enough? Um, I mean, I think it's maybe not that as much as seeing, learning from your business. Like, uh, I really like going and talking to the people who run our data centers. I love this last clip because it gets right to the heart of the corporate value question. Larry Page suggests that the way they create value with their diverse businesses is because it creates a company for entrepreneurs. My interpretation of this is that Alphabet is valuable because its employees can reallocate across exciting business opportunities. This enables them to retain and attract better employees than most other firms. To summarize, we've learned that conglomerates, while popular in the 60s and 70s, have fallen out of favor with Wall Street today because there's increased skepticism that they can create value in a developed economy. A primary justification for conglomerates is efficient internal capital markets, but many studies have shown that managers tend to misallocate resources, which decreases firm value. Of course, your readings for this last lesson suggest that emerging economies offer an opportunity for conglomerate firms. And this is primarily because they operate in markets with weak institutions. The conglomerates can transact more efficiently than the market. This skepticism in developed markets has fueled increased governance to assure corporate value is added and not subtracted. Finally, while our review of the three conglomerates was a bit superficial, our point is that justification for adding or subtracting a business must be coherent. By being explicit about the factors that are coherent, corporate strategists can do more qualitative and quantitative due diligence to assure that more value is added than subtracted. Signing off for now, I hope you found this useful.